The rise of the far right in Europe, populist shifts and the othering, editing by Gabriella Lapertis, Giovanna Campani, and Annie Bonaviste. Introduction, populism, the concept, and its definitions. The most recent European elections in 2014 saw the rise of parties labeled populist across the European Union. The prominence in Denmark of the Dansk Folk Party, in Slovenia of the Slovenian Democratic Party, of Front National in France, the high scores of the United Kingdom Independence Party, the Beppe Grillo's movement, Kink Stel, the Five Star Movement in Italy, the new MEP seats won by the Freedom Party of Austria have all been perceived as turning points that are changing the face of the European Parliament and are challenging at some level the hedge money of the big four well-established European political forces leading the Strasbourg Assembly in this context. The surprisingly weak performance of the Dutch PVV or Party of Freedom, appears to be the single exception to this visible trend of the EU political life. Populism has become a major issue in many countries of the European Union. A ghost is haunting Europe, the ghost of populism. It is hard to identify many characteristics these figures of contemporary populism have in common. Can Marine Le Pen and Pepe Grillo really be united under the same political banner? Does it make sense to compare gay rights supporter Gertz Wilders and the Catholic conservative Timo Sunini and the neo-Nazis Michael Loikos, or to associate the kink style with the anti-immigration Dansk Folk Party? Even if we focus on the organizations traditionally considered radical right or far right, the differences of contracting alliances and building a parliamentary group to gain influence show that their links are not obvious. A far cry from the idea of similarity suggested by an umbrella concept such as populism. For example, Front National and Lega Nord were rejected by the UKIP. Front National rejects Golden Dawn and Five Star Movement denounces the fascist threat represented by the far right parties, such as the Front National or Jobbik in Hungary. This book aims to provide a critical understanding of current European trends and considers the complex phenomena covered by the notion of populism, focusing especially on the right wing populism. It also recommends ways these can be challenged both in theory and in practice by using the gender, race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, intersectionality approach. The book explores how we can make populism a tangible concept. What is it supposed to express? A value system, an ideology, a political style, or a way of using narratives? Populism does not actually appear to fit into any classical classification of political parties. It challenges its intelligibility. To avoid the temptation of using it, depending on the context as a synonym for nationalism, racism, Euroscepticism, and sometimes even anti-establishment. We first question the concept itself, aiming to deconstruct it and go beyond. In exploring the literature on populism, we face the same complexity. The sheer variety of political parties and movements labeled populist has led some scholars to call the phenomenon itself a chameleon. Karen Priester, for instance, chose the subtle approaching a chameleon for the 2012 book in which she references Paul Taggart, who writes of the chameleon-like quality and the empty heart of populism. The complexity increased by the assertion of authors such as Margaret Conovan or Pierre-André Tegarif that fieldwork offers a definition rather than a theoretical baseline. 
An empirical grounded approach seeks to overcome the fluidity of the definitions by providing many ethnographic heuristic texts about the populist formations all across Europe, even if these contain no references to theory. This book is an empirical study exploring the flexible application of the meaning of populism in eight different countries in Europe. Austria, Bulgaria, Denmark, France, Greece, Italy, Slovenia, and the UK. With diverse historical trajectories and various political party systems, each with its own rules, languages, and political games. Populism, a problematic concept. The term populism has become a very common way to describe many very different movements in politics both in Europe and outside the European continent. Since the 1980s, it has been used to evoke the transformation of political ideology and practices with rhetoric, style, or narratives designed to conquer electoral audiences. In Europe, the contemporary success of this notion is linked to the rise of new kinds of far-right movements in the 1980s and the emergence of the leaders as Jean-Marie Le Pen, George Hayter, or Umberto Bossi. In the 1990s, it was used to describe the rise of Latin American leaders claiming to oppose neoliberalism, such as Hugo Chavez in Venezuela or Evo Morales in Bolivia. Mood and Kallweiser speak of the inclusionary populism in Latin America as opposed to the exclusionary populism in Europe. It is now a common way of speaking about European radical left forces such as Oscar Lafontaine's Die Mink in Germany or Jean-Luc Melchion Front de Gouache in France or Alexis Piras S-Y-R-I-Z-A in Greece. And populism is no longer associated solely with parties situated in the periphery of the main positions of power. Even the mainstream party leaders are facing the risk of being discredited by the label populist. At the intersection of media and academia, populism quickly invaded the political field and certain electoral circumstances was used as a pejorative term. Because of its wide-ranging application and its common meaning, the technical content of the notion seems to be problematic. It is difficult to agree on a consensual definition of populism. In addition to an ideological issue, several historical references position various kinds of movements in a situation of conceptual uncertainty that has been summed up by Damanti. Populism is one of the words that appear the most in political discourse for some time now. Without much difference, however, between scientific environment, public, political, and everyday life, indeed it is a fascinating concept, able to suggest without imposing too much precise and definitive meaning. In fact, it does not define, but evokes. The invasive and normative extension of the concept tends to obscure its theoretical value. How can populism become a heuristic notion under these conditions? Nowadays, it seems to be impossible to completely avoid the term, but the disparity of the context makes it hard to agree on a common definition that transcends borders and national peculiarities. Several authors, such as Margaret Conovan, give preference to empirical classifications. Others define populism by its emphasis on the people and the elite, and supposedly homogenous people standing against the elite not only within a particular country, but also on the EU and global levels, and against others defined by race, religion, ethnic origin, or sexuality. As Palenka writes, contemporary populism is directed against elites who have opened the doors to foreign influence and to foreigners. But as an ideology, populism does not tell us who the elite and the people are, what they do, and what they think, so it can be found in many forms, contingent on the existing relationships between the government and the society. The widespread acceptance and the populist label given to many organizations 
not only contributes to the inflation of the neologicism about populism already pointed out by Zay, neopopulism, national populism, europopulism, modern populism, new populism, it also expands the provision of definitions available in literature. Nowadays, there is a common diffusion that creates a singular situation. It seems to be impossible to completely avoid the term, but the disparity of the context makes it really hard to arrive at a common definition that can cross borders and national peculiarities. It also explains the provision of definitions available in the literature, each author often having their own. The concept is so frequently used that studies already exist which begin with a review of the scientific literature about the issue. Indeed, it would be possible to assemble a review of the reviews. In some cases, populism does not fit into the political situation. In several countries, it needs to be divided into different categories to make it suitable for academic research. In these cases, the concept populism makes sense as a way of distinguishing between several forces. In Denmark, the Donks Folk Party, now the third largest party in the country, illustrates pragmatic and respectful populism far from the radical anti-Islamic views diffused by networks and right groups such as the Free Press Society. In Bulgaria, soft populism is used in connection with the comeback of the former king, Simon Saksborowski, who won an election by capitalizing on his own name and personal resources, while hard populism is symbolized by the organization Attica, producer of hate speeches and supporter of discrimination against others. The wide range of populism definition makes it hard to express all the criteria that are considered essential to a firm explanation of the concept, except that populism has always been used in a negative sense by governing elites to characterize any form of opposition that claims to represent the people's voice without basing its policy declarations on real facts and viable solutions to actual problems. All definitions show the constitutive ambiguity of the concept. While scholars tend to regard it as a style of political argument that can be found in virtually all parties. Whatever the case, Pels argues that it would be dangerous to reduce the new right-wing populism to a frivolity of form, pose, and style, and to think that there is no substance between its political style. Hence, the fundamental question remains, what is populism? How can we make populism a solid concept? What situations can it explain? What is it supposed to express? A system of values, an ideology, a political style, or a way to use narratives? How far is populism from fascism? For example, in all its aspects. In this book, the Italian chapter presents the academic debates around the connections that can be made between fascism and populism. Is fascism populism? Is populism a modern, acceptable term to evoke similar issues and evolution? Even if it is more localized in the countries which have known fascist or Nazi regimes, the reference to the ideologies of the 1930s appears to be omnipresent in academic debate. What is populism supposed to characterize? Should populism be considered an ideology, an individual political style? Does the concept more usefully describe a certain position inside politics? Many theoricians of the field raise all of these dimensions. Karen Priester organizes definitions of populism into three groups according to whether it's understood as an ideology, a strategy to attain and stay in power, or a discursive practice, but without attempting an overarching definition. This is also true of Simov and Krustov. The criteria they use for populism are the appeal to the people as a whole, as opposed to corrupt and impotent political elites, opposition to the key idea of liberal democracy, 
that the political majority should be limited in important ways by constitutional constraints, and the rejection of the political correctness of liberalism, meaning a challenge to at least some elements that are seen as liberal consensus of the transition period, market-oriented reforms, integration in Euro-Atlantic organizations, rejection of nationalistic language and behavior. Clarification is important here. Depending on the category populism fits into, it can be linked to certain conceptual channels. If populism is an ideology, it belongs in the system of values it aims to defend. What are the foundations in this ideological trend? In this case, the differences between populism and other classical and historical ideological standpoints of the radical right must be questioned. How far is, for example, populism from racism in all its aspects? Big differences on the issue can be seen between countries and most of the time between different organizations and case studies presented by the same country. The biggest parties and structures usually tend to avoid visible direct racist speeches, whereas the smaller groups, which often remain on the edge of institutional politics, are more radical. But most of them, even when they eliminate classical racist vocabulary, defend nationalist ideas and values. By the same logic, in Italy, academic debates around the connections that can be made between fascism and populism appear in the Encyclopedia of Social Sciences. Is far-right populism an acceptable modern term to describe similar issues and evolution? Even if it is more localized in countries that have known fascist or Nazi regimes, reference to the ideologies of the 1930s appears to be omnipresent. But the most obvious link for the vast majority of organizations described as populist is with nationalism. How does populism combine with nationalism? A rich and interesting literature states that populism, with its naturalistic and essentialist and restrictive depiction of the people, is a byproduct by the reaffirmation of a deeply culturally ingrained perception of social belonging of the foundations of polity in which the whole is considered prior to the individual and thus is linked to nationalism. The Herrerian concept of the nation is as naturally ordained and homogeneous whole, a national individuality with specific and unique characteristics that supplies its members with the norms of behavior, as well as forms of identity. This understanding of nationalism clearly discloses its exclusive features and the essentialization and naturalization of the nation results in the construction of the nation's non-members as undesirable others. Within this framework, boundaries are defined ethically. Therefore, whether as an imagined or invented national identity, or as the privileging of natural community, the promotion of a monolithic homogeneous group legitimizes a sense of territoriality within the polity's borders. The nationalist interpretation of populism equates the people with the ethnic nation and thus strengthens the eternal value of the organic community and reinforces its exclusionary nature. Analyses of such populist manifestations underline the marginalization of those not belonging to the majority group, which can be easily led to ethnic cleansing, a latent possibility once the discursive construction of the community proceeds along purely ethnic lines. In other words, in order to safeguard eternal cohesion, populist nationalism not only excludes others, but in fact rejects all forms of pluralism and difference in the community of people, relegating all uncertainties or conflicts beyond the borders of nation-state. 
Given the diversity of populist forces present in Europe, the term the people does not coincide with the nation as bounded by the territory of the nation state. In order to shed light on the connection between populism and nationalism, the chapters in this book go beyond the state of the art on populism, taking into account the theoretical approaches from research on race, ethnicity, and ethnic boundaries. Furthermore, since the symbolic construction of ethnic and national identities can be compared with the symbolic references employed by populists in this context, the question arises is what imagined roots populists attribute to themselves and how they compare to national myths and officially endorsed histories. This is of crucial importance for the populist manifestations that can be labeled as populist nationalist, involving race, ethnicity aspect, and the definition of their movement or party identity. Since Tegreff's work, national populism has been a label commonly used to describe the modern far right. For other authors, such as Germani, every populism, even those in Latin American countries, is nationalist. As the chapters in this group show, in many cases, ethnic considerations prevail. In other cases, opposition to immigration is the first criterion. The definition of nationalist is close to the official administrative one, leaving the ethnic aspects in the background. Sometimes, as for UKIP, the anti-EU rhetoric directly builds on the core of national views about sovereignty. Behind the construction of nationalism, a system of gender relations is implicitly put in place. Any analysis of the populist phenomenon is enhanced by the attention to the role of gender. Scholars have consistently and convincingly argued that the national community is envisioned as gendered and heteropatriarchal construction of the people as a family, a sort of metaphoric kinship, or in other words, as a family writ large. Indeed, the metaphor of family is indispensable to nationalism. The nation is depicted as one great family, the members as brothers and sisters of the motherland or fatherland speaking their mother tongue. In this way, the family of the nation overrides and replaces the individual's family, but evokes similarly strong loyalties and vivid attachment. However, feminist scholars argue that such an interpretation suggests that the nation was founded on gender bias and inequality and does not allocate sufficient weight or semblance on gender to construct of identities. Rather, populist parties are characterized at their core by gender differences which are not automatically enabling. Finally, populism as an ideology questions the strength of conservative values in European societies. Once again, the appropriation and demonstration of issues can vary a lot according to the organizations and countries examined in this book. Some of them claim their modernity defending it against new threats, especially the rise of Islam. Many of these forces claim their religious affiliation as key to their fight. Catholicism in Slovenia, France, or Italy, and the Orthodox religion in Bulgaria and Greece are among the basic identities proposed by populists. In political and ideological terms, it usually goes with strong opposition to women's rights and sometimes to abortion, LGBTQ plus rights, or homosexuality itself. In the light of these issues, in front of nationalist visions and conservative values, we should wonder whether populism constitutes a new phenomenon. In other words, its recent rise and dispersion across Europe could be, at some levels, the renewal of old ideas and propositions now translated into the language of modern political contests, finding an incarnation in new style of politician that is immediately recognizable and gives populist organizations in different countries some family resemblance. 
mode distinguishes between populism as an ideology and populism as style. He states categorically that despite the greater visibility of the former, the key challenge comes from the latter. In my view, even though populism as ideology is theoretically considered as the principal danger, in actuality the main threat in Europe today is populism as style. If populism is considered an individual political style, its modernity and its foundations deserve to be analyzed. As shown in this book, not all populist leaders act in the same way, but they manage to be distinguished from the classical figures of established politicians. Being considered populist means introducing discontinuities in common behaviors, acting indifferently from the rest of politicians. This perspective emphasizes the role of personality in current populism wave. All the organizations discussed in the book are associated with one or a small number of strong leaders who can be at the same time spokesmen, leaders, and in some cases founders of their party, movement, or network. The most famous of them, Jean-Marie Le Pen to Nigel Farge, from George Hayter to Pia Jardsgaard, have all accumulated these different functions. It also questions the importance of the media in the production of others, the enemy, a phenomenon, according to Waddock, manifests itself as politics of fear. Sometimes the scapegoats are Jews, sometimes Muslims, sometimes ethnic minorities, women, anarchists, homosexuals, and so on. As Waddock writes, the discursive strategies of victim-perpetrator reversal, scapegoating, and the construction of conspiracy theories belong to the necessary toolkit of right-wing populist rhetoric. In short, anybody can potentially be constructed as dangerous other, and should it become expedient for specific strategic and manipulative purposes. It is difficult to describe the main aspects of a populist style. Some authors, such as Crick, have suggested descriptions, a style of populist and rhetoric that seeks to arouse a majority, or at least what their leaders passionately believe is a majority, who are, have been, or think themselves to be outside of polity scorned and despised by an educated establishment. At a more general level, it can be seen as an illustration of what Albert Hirschman calls voice in his famous triptych of protestation. Populism is always a form of protest against the establishment, loudly expressed in a way that encourages large audiences. At least two characteristics of this style are commonly described in literature. The charisma of the leaders. The role of this particularly rare virtue is always hard to analyze in mass media because since Max Weber has been understood that charisma cannot be intelligible without specific bonds linking the leader to their public. But specific properties of certain possibilities are undoubtedly of decisive importance considering the symbolic capital they accumulate and the opportunities it offers them. The Bulgarian case in this book underlines, for example, the central function of charisma in soft populism exemplified by the surprising comeback of the former king in the early 2000s. Meanwhile, the French case shows the importance of Marine Le Pen's charisma of the Front National's new lease of life in the recent years. For Martin Redsgill, this charismatic dimension is even one of the main characteristics of populism, with this focus on a strong leader while in contrast with the homogeneous collective identity that is often linked to racism and xenophobia is being invoked. The use of specific rhetoric. Rhetoric is at the heart of the literature on populist issues. 
As Margaret Conovan says, more recent studies tend to focus on populist discourse, a rhetoric of appeals to the people. If the narratives can be really different in relation to various national contexts, there is a resemblance of the way the people is loudly invoked against the establishment to denounce the failure of mainstream organizations or to combine classical left-wing issues with conservative nationalist ones. A famous example is The Village Idiot of the historical leader Lega Nord, Umberto Bossi. But the key condition seems to be the ability to play on the emotional register, to use speeches and arguments to raise the effects of people and to arouse their immediate feelings. This effective dimension crops up in all the country cases. Finally, populism is often used as a key word to express certain position in the political field, depending on the kind of populist organizations that are competing in certain countries. In this logic, it is the topographic semantics that must be considered to make populism understandable. In some countries, organizations described as figures of populism can be classified without any discussion of the far right because they hold extreme or outrageous points of views in which are far more radical than those of all government or mainstream parties. Examples include Attica in Bulgaria, English Defense Leave in the UK, Forza Nova in Italy, and Golden Dawn in Greece. All these organizations are sometimes claimed with pride by some activists to belong to this category. But in some other scenarios, populism is used to cover an other scenario. The concept is today probably mainly used to describe a modernist far right that is avoiding extremism, presenting realistic propositions, cleansing the internal membership to expel more radical members, and thus openly joining the democratic competition for power. Consider Negalord or FPO who have recently been part of the national governments. The Denks Folk Party UKIP or Marine Le Pen's New Look Front National have all spent time disciplining their ranks and training the intermediary leaders and executives. They try to expel more extreme elements to control the Facebook pages, Twitter accounts, or personal blogs of members or activists. The shift is important because these organizations are seeking respectability and rejecting other small far-right groups or splinter groups now considered people to be avoided. On some level, they are seeking a new political position somewhere between right-wing and far-right. Priester positions populism between the parliamentary and extra-parliamentary right-wing. In her view, it is neither right-wing extremism nor conservative, but an amalgam of the two. That is why links with mainstream right-wing parties have been built in several countries. This is also the reason for mainstreaming of certain far-right ideas, which are now expanding inside right-wing parties and government. As in the French case, where the trend named the strong right is a leading position within the right-wing party, Les Republicains. To conclude, the impossibility of reaching a valuable definition of populism is linked to the catch-all aspect of the term, to the normative context it is supposed to evoke, and to the multiple dimensions, sometimes weirdly mixed, that are included in academic uses of the term. We could, of course, add the question of translation and adaptation of the term to each national political situation, always defined to be meaningful to the specific context of the country. In all of the countries studied in this book, there is a central organization that figures as paradynamic of populism that broadly defines what academics talk about when they discuss populism. 
In Austria, for example, the FPO is a key example for understanding of the phenomenon. In France, Front National is at the heart of all discussions on the far right, extremism, populism, and even racism. In Finland, non examine in this book, true Finns represent an Axel model, with political movements especially relevant to the Finnish case that is envisioned by Vito Hillander, which is characterized by the idealization of a simple rural life and ordinary people, emerges in crisis or transition periods, and aims to return power to the people by, for example, favoring small entrepreneurs instead of international corporations and opposing bureaucrats. This book aims to shed light on a field of study characterized by highly uncertain theoretical frames and redefine and assess the topologies and characters attributed to populist parties and forces in the countries under study. Clarify and highlight the differences between populist experiences in the central and eastern and western parts of the EU member states covered in the book. Bring new elements to understanding of the continuities and discontinuities of the authoritarian experiences of the past. And, with nationalism, explore the relationship between populism on one hand, democracy and power on the other, through the intersectionality approach. Link to populism, to sexism and racism, substantively and theoretically investigating the articulation between various, sometimes contradictory, political positions in the policy domains of direct importance. Analyze how populist rhetoric influences the political arena and mainstream culture. Clarify the impact of populist parties and anti-discrimination and gender equality agenda promoted by the EU in those countries where they have been or are in power. Provide tools for policymakers to promote a peace and gender equality culture, questioning the boundaries and borders that are centralized by populism but are also legitimized by mainstream political culture. Chapter 2 explores the link between neo-fascism and populism in Italian political history. Neo-fascism represents a political movement deeply rooted in Italian history dating back to the end of the 1940s. Over the years, it has produced various expressions, some of which has been incorporated into parliamentary dynamics, while some have chosen the anti-system path. Both trends have preserved traditional elements and at the same time, readaptive traditional messages, including anti-Semitism, anti-capitalism, and anti-Americanism. In this chapter, Campani looks at the political dynamics surrounding the evolution of neo-fascism and the neo-fascist groups and parties post-war Italy up to the present day, then to concentrates on two neo-fascist organizations formed in the 1990s, Forza Nova and Casa Pound. She analyzes their symbols, values, beliefs, and forms of othering, marking the division between us and the others, an in-depth understanding of the history, the manifestos, and the political activities of the two organizations informs the outline of the differences between neo-fascism and neo-populism. While neo-fascism has a strong ideological dimension, neo-populism is a chameleon-like trend spreading across a great number of EU countries responding to various challenges globalization, post-industrial economic conditions, immigration, and European Union constraints. And Italy is represented by the Northern League. Campani shows how neo-fascism and neo-populism overlap in targeting some topics, such as hostility to immigration, and how they both tend to oppose the system and corrupt politics and financial capitalism an EU that is an instrument of financial capitalism and has deprived Italy of sovereignty. But although they may combine in some cases, populism and neo-fascism are a distinct phenomena. 
The concepts of people and the role of the state are very different in populism and neo-fascism. The last section of the chapter looks at the victims of neo-fascist organizations and the resistance to them that has been established by organizations like National Association of Italian Partisans. The third chapter presents an in-depth study of French Front National and anti-Islam networks, focusing on the reasons for growing influence of far-right ideas in France and the weakening of anti-racist and anti-discrimination movements despite their historical presence. Front National is described through its ideological production and its evolution, its conception of the other, and the links with other organizations or institution whose intellectual work can build political and ideological cleavages. The analysis of data collected from interviewees who are all strong Marine Le Pen supporters illustrates the party's new recruitment strategy and the new orientation it seeks to adopt to become a regular political party. Bonaviste and Pingod also explore the latest French far-right trend that has emerged in the 2000s and situates Islam as the principal enemy. These individual activists linked to the international anti-Islam or counter-jihad network that is being built in Europe have developed a new way of observing French society through the lens of Islamic issues. The chapter ends with the analysis of the role played by anti-far-right organizations in combating hate speech and crime against the other. Chapter 4 focuses on Austria, one of the first European countries with a successful right-wing extremist party, the Freedom Party Austria. This chapter aims to answer the question why right-wing extremism has been successful and why it is therefore difficult for anti-racist movements to counter FPO's discourses. Sauer and Anjovic approach this question by analyzing first the discursive strategies of the party, second, the resonance of these policies in right-wing populist movements such as the Venice anti-mosque movement, and third, counter-strategies to these discriminatory and racist discourses in Austria. The chapter shows how right-wing populist groups in Austria construct binary groups of us and the others, as well as gender binaries, as these strategies successfully create societal problems, enemies who cause them, and victims who are affected by them. An us group thus becomes represented by right-wing extremist groups. The chapter also deconstructs strategies of consensus building and hegemony around migration issues. The article begins with a context section, which outlines the rise of populist right-wing Austria starting with the transformation of the FPO under George Hayter's leadership in the late 1980s. This section contextualizes the early emergence of right-wing populism in Austria's political establishment as well as in the neoliberal transformations of the country after the EU ascension and explains the role of other right-wing and anti-migrant actors in the country. The chapter then illustrates metaphors, symbols, and narratives, as well as framing their use by right-wing extremist parties and groups, especially when referring to the problems of migration, Islam, and the EU, and the changing gender relations. These claims of equivalence create a hegemonic discourse of inequality and hence exclusion. The second part of the analysis outlines strategies within civil society fighting racism and the othering on the grounds of ethnicity, nationality, gender, or sexuality by Austrian right-wing groups and seeks to establish whether these counter-strategies are adequate. Chapter 5 looks at right-wing populism in Denmark. Scholars suggest that Danish and Scandinavian welfare and gender regimes have influenced the way populism has emerged developed and been consolidated in the past half centuries. It has been argued that Scandinavia developed a form of welfare nationalism that since the late 1960s has linked national, social, and democratic values with social equality, democracy, and gender equality in the construction of national belonging and identity. 
Since the 1990s, mainstream political parties have reframed the relationship between national, democratic, and social questions. Sim and Moret suggest that the Danish understanding of the nation and the people has been reinterpreted by the populist right. The chapter presents the results of two case studies of contemporary right-wing populism, the Danish People's Party and the Free Press Society, and focuses on the heritage shifts and variations in the ideology of the populist right. The findings suggest that constructions of the nation, the people, and other biradical right-wing populist actors are diverse. The DPP claims to address the problems and concerns of the common man, the native Dane, and aims to defend the people's interests against immigration and against elites damaging national sovereignty, culture, and identity. This contrasts with the Free Press Society, which has developed a rhetoric and discourse aimed at mobilizing the intellectual elites against the dangers of Islam, aiming itself as the defender of the universal value of free speech in the Western world. Finally, the chapter presents some of the counter-strategies to the politics of fear fostered by the populist right, referring to interviews with victims, organizations, and democratic antibodies engaged in strategies for the rights of migrants, asylum seekers, refugees, and the LGBTQ plus community. This leads to a discussion of the strengths and weaknesses of the Danish approach to counter strategies against hate speech, othering, and racism. Chapter 6 looks at how the political shifts in the post-1989 period in Central and Eastern Europe and the military conflicts in the Balkans have intensified ethnic nationalism in these societies, but have at the same time given rise to populist discourses by the extreme right and consequently to intolerance, hatred, othering, and true national values allegedly suppressed by the communist regime. One of the former Yugoslavia republics, Slovenia, was no exception. The rise of the right in the Slovenian context meant the rise of a mixture of authoritarianism, traditionalism, religion, and nativism. Populist re-traditionalism of post-socialist Slovenia found its new enemies and various groups of others who were imagined as endangering the future of the nation and its people. Pajnik, Kuhar, and Sori suggest that the process of establishing independent statehood brought about two types of populist discourse, ethno-nationalist and ethno-religious populism. The former is linked to attempts to differentiate the Slovenian national identity from anything regarded as Balkan, which became a metaphor for backward and primitive, while the latter came about through the onset of re-traditionalism of the Slovenian society, with conservative and religious actors regaining power after years of repression under the previous political system. The chapter analyzes the two contexts through two case studies, the right-wing Slovenian Democratic Party and the Catholic Church-based Civil Initiative for the Family and the Rights of Children. The chapter also reflects, first, on the consequences of populist exclusion, and specifically on the effects on the victims or target groups, such as anti-politics, and second, on anti-populism, anti-racism, and anti-sexism initiatives that counteract populist exclusion and provide space for the practice of alternative politics. Chapter 7 looks at the Bulgarian national populism. During the first decade of its democratic transition, Bulgaria enjoyed a shy nationalism. Once democracy was consolidated, radical national populism emerged. Several aspects of the latter were analyzed by Anna Kraseva. This puts the spotlight on Attica in a case study of this first and most emblematic national populist party in Bulgaria. It is left ring, right ring, everything. If Attica occupies such an electric position along the classical socio-economic and political cleavages, it is because the party seeks to position itself along a new type of cleavage. It is transitioning from party politics to symbolic politics, from ideological to identity politics, from social, economic, and political to cultural cleavages. 
the second party perspective verifies in the case of Bulgaria the perspective of Eastern Europe as backsliding and the usual suspect for every kind of extremist nationalism. The genesis and rise of the populism is studied in a regard to the diversification of its actors who are compared in the terms of agency, politics, and power. The third perspective reconstructs the symbolic cartography and maps the three poles of identitarianism, the politics of fear and overproduction of othering, post-secularism, the religiousization of politics exemplified by orthodox solidarity and statism, the politics of sovereignty versus nationalism. Far-right populism is, and often wants to be, a paradoxical phenomenon. The concluding section looks at the emerging antibodies against this phenomenon. Chapter 8 examines the case of far-right populism in three political parties in Greece. Golden Dawn, L-A-O-S, and A-N-E-L. Since 2007, different forms of far-right populism parties have achieved not only parliamentary representation, but also participation in coalition governments. With a realignment of the electorate away from the established political parties, far-right populism has produced a strong impact with its rhetoric of nationalism, extremism, xenophobia, and racism. The analysis follows the road that led to support the parties with challenging level of legitimacy, seeking a wider understanding of the collective identity and the popularized version of hate crimes in a profoundly entangled country struggling to overcome a period of economic and sociopolitical crisis. Chapter 9 examines the role of identitarian populism in othering and hate incidents which focus on three populist groups in Britain, the United Kingdom Independence Party, the British National Party, and the English Defence League. Evidence suggests that the leadership of UKIP, BNP, and EDL recognize the importance of a more popularized rhetoric to attracting the attention of the public. UKIP's position on EU migration and homophobic sentiments, and similarly EDL's Islamophobic tactics, place the other at the center of their discourse. The victim representatives arguing that mainstream culture and politics have the greatest impact on, for example, hate speech and hate crime in general. The chapter concludes that the violent activities of the EDL, the rhetoric of the UKIP and the BNP, and the inconsistent media coverage create a breeding ground for the politics of fear. In applying content analysis and frame analysis tools, the main aim of this book was to identify how right-wing populist groups construct binary groups of us and the others, as well as gender binaries. As these strategies succeed, creating societal problems, enemies who cause them, and victims who are affected by them, thus constructing an us group represented by right-wing extremist groups in Europe was gathered during a major comparative research project on hate speech and populist othering in Europe through the Racism, Age, Gender, Looking Glass. Directed by Gabriela Lazardis and funded by the EU's Justice and Home Affairs. The fieldwork was conducted in eight member states of the EU. The data is drawn from interviews with members of the relevant right-wing parties, organizations, and groups and with representatives of NGOs engaged in fighting racism and discrimination, and was gathered through an integrated, multi-method approach. Content analysis, focus groups, in-depth, open-ended interviews, online media analysis, etc. This method combines the advantages of extensive transnational comparative data analysis and the maximization of interpretive depth research at the discursive, attitudinal, and behavioral levels. The eight studies situating populism within the specific national context where it is developing and growing represent a rich resource. 
the detailed exploration of the entire available literature, which of course includes many field studies, enables us to evaluate how the different aspects and manifestations of far-right populism come together in these countries in a complex combination of, of national social situations, the state of the political offering realignments in politics, and the international circulation of references and models. Systemic analysis of populist parties and movements that are not only challenging the EU project and the EU policies, but also fighting to be represented at EU level, are still lacking in the European and international context. As this book shows, European populism finds a source of inspiration in the opposition to the EU's aims by confronting directly the EU construction and sometimes exploiting political and economic advantages, such as the economic crisis and participation in the European Parliament. Further research is needed to look in particular at how the construction of an essentialized homogeneous people affects the idea of Europe. The various interpretations of the collective identities and boundaries produced by populist movements in relation to the nation presented in this book are an important starting point, but they only touch upon the European dimension, which means a rejection of the EU and a different idea of Europe, the rejection of the supranational EU concept of governments is justified by the evocation of collective identifications of the homeland representing a more potent and durable influence than any other collective cultural identities, which is likely to continue to command humanity's allegiance for a long time to come, even when other larger scale but looser forms of collective identity emerge alongside national one. It is clear from the material presented in this book that national populism changes affiliation to post-nationalist projects such as the EU and the EU project and the unity of diversity. Populist parties and forces need to be analyzed in the crucial area of divergent opposition to the EU project. How the EU model as a voluntary union of nations deciding on common policies is based on representative democracy is being attacked because of its alleged inefficiency and its distance from authentic European traditions and the European people. The idea of a stable national identity implies not merely the refusal of the idea of a common Europe, but the construction of a Europe of the homelands. The idea of Europe is of course linked to the common European identity and to the common memory. The questions that arise are, what are the positions of populace in relation to a common European historical memory? when viewed against the background of totalitarianism and authoritarianism. How does this affect altitudes, the Russian Federation, which is also affected by the growing phenomenon of populism? How do populist parties and movements oppose actions that aim to make the EU a multi-layer, multicultural democracy that is based on mutual respect for its diverse peoples and cultures, values diversity and inclusion, and runs decidedly counter to hierarchies, inequalities, and exclusion. How do they erect obstacles on the road to establishing European citizenship through the overcoming of racism and sexism? How are these forces and parties, while veriferously opposing the European project in the EU, becoming increasingly involved in various types of transnational and international relations? Examples are bilateral contacts and the representation in the European Parliament.